two, two um, sessions this afternoon. And our first speaker is, is Yan Sun, who is a PhD student from the School of Architecture and the Built Environment at Queensland University of Technology. And her paper is on about evaluating the need for recovery from work for site-based construction practitioners. And because we only have three presenters in this session, we'll have 20 minutes, so 15 minutes for presentation and then five minutes for questions. Thank you, Yann. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, let's start. Uh, Is it okay? Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Today, I would like to uh, talk something about need for recovery in the construction industry. Um, this research is part of the DECRA project, Improving Mental Health and Safety in the Construction Industry, sponsored by the Australian Research Council. I am the presenter, Chen Jin Yan Sun. You can just simply call me Yan. Our team includes researchers from the Queensland University of Technology and the University of Queensland. So today, my presentation will mainly include four parts. Starts from the introduction and methodology and then findings. Finally, we draw the conclusions. Let's first come to the introduction. So everybody needs a break after a busy day at work. So restore their energy for the next working day. So what is the need for recovery? And what is the mechanism of need for recovery? This figure can help us to answer these two questions. Actually, need for recovery is derived from the effort recovery model. So this model describes how job characteristics induce load effects and finally result in the adverse consequences on people's health and well-being. Let's look at this model from the left to the right. So job demand, such as the excessive workloads and long work hours and interpersonal conflict, all these will need workers' physical and mental expenditure and then produce costs on the load effects and in the transformation from job demands to the load effects, job control will play an important role in this transformation. So what is job control? Job control in this model means the recovery opportunities such as the control work hours and control the time to break. So you may find another important element in this model we call work potential. Work potential in this model represent, uh, represents personal characteristics. So the need for recovery actually the dynamic combination of job demands, job control, and personal characteristics. Time span is another important concept in this model. So for short term fatigue, it can be reversed after people get enough recuperation. Otherwise, it will be transformed into the mental or physical load in the end of the working day and then flow into the next working day. So in this way, need for recovery will accumulate. And if this lasts for a long time, it will finally result in the adverse consequences, such as the depression and burnout. And work potential and job control still plays an important role in the accumulation of need for recovery. But in this stage, the recovery mechanism fails. That means um, recovery opportunities will not help people to go back to work without any symptoms. So after understanding the need for recovery, let's apply this model to the construction industry to discuss why we need to study need for recovery in the construction industry. This is mainly a tribute to the characteristics in the construction industry. As we all know, construction industry is labor intensive uh, with high work pressure, especially for those site-based construction workers. The work tasks require high physical demands and 
construction workers need to work long hours in a poor physical environment. All these will deplete the physical and mental resources of construction workers. And if they get enough recuperation, the short term fatigue will be uh, reversed in the end of the day. However, if they cannot get enough recuperation, the need for recovery will accumulate and finally result in the work induced health and safety issues and even reduce the productivity. So from the perspective of health and safety and also the productivity, it is necessary and important to study need for recovery in the construction industry. However, at present, only limited studies, construction studies, focus on the need for recovery, and none of them was conducted in the Australian construction industry. The overall understanding of need for recovery in the construction industry actually is not sufficient. So, to fill, uh, to fill these research gaps and in response to uh, the call for research on the impact of demographics on the need for recovery, our research starts out from, uh, with the dem demographic variables, such as the gender, age, marital status, and also other demographics, as well as the work hours to explore the uh, relationships between personal profiles and the need for recovery. The next section, so how we study the need for recovery in the construction industry. So a questionnaire survey was designed and distributed in the construction, uh, Australian construction industry as this uh, research is ongoing at that time. So finally, we got 163 valid cases at that time. And then based on these valid data, we do some data analysis. First, we use the descriptive analysis to summarize and describe the data in a constructive way. And then one way ANOVA will be, uh, uh, was used to examine the significant differences in the, uh, in the need for recovery for different groups. Correlation analysis also was conducted to examine their associations between different variables. And then finally, the two-way ANOVA was used to uh, explore whether their was some interaction effect of the independent variables on the need for recovery. So the final outcomes is the relationships between personal profiles and need for recovery. Now let's review the findings of this refer, uh, the research. This table summarizes uh, the demographic analysis and the one-way ANOVA. So we can see that uh, only the differences in need for recovery uh, for the age and work hours group show the statistics uh, significant. So let's first look at the age group. When you, when you see the column of the mean, you can see that the need for recovery actually decreased with the, uh, with the age. This uh, negative relationships also was found by the correlation analysis, you can see here the age and the need for recovery, they have an active association. And then why we, why the, we, we get these findings? Uh, this may be because for the older construction workers, they may spend less effort to get the high job performance because uh, due to they have the experience and expertise. And also for the younger construction workers, they, there may be a steep learning curve and this will impose the load on, impose the workload on them. And then there is also foreseeable for younger construction workers, they may have less, con less job control and also uh, they may have the less job control on it. So with the less job control, we can see that in the need for recovery model, the last uh, the job control play an important role in the need for recovery. So this may also influence. And then let's look at the work hours group. Uh, it is not surprise, surprising to find the need for recovery increased with work hours. 
that's because the work hours, work long hours may take the time for them to recovery and the recovery opportunities. But it is surprising to find, let's say the last group, when people work over 60 hours, actually the need for recovery score uh, decreased a little bit. This may maybe because if you see the sample size distribution in this group, there was not a lot of sample size. And this may maybe also come down to the personal differences and also the tolerance of the long work hours because the actually working long hours in the construction industry is very common. So people may have a higher level of tolerance of these long work hours. And also we can uh, think about the work or home resources for them to deal with the tasks. So it may also decrease, if they have these kind of resources, it may also decrease their need for recovery. Uh, this table shows the two results of two-way ANOVA. Finally, we only find the significant re uh, relationships for the interaction of work experience and work hours on the need for recovery. Let's look at this figure. It, it, it explains the interaction effect of work experience and work hours on the need for recovery. Uh, the horizontal X represents the work experience and the vertical X represents the need for recovery. And different colors of bar means the different work hours. Um, this figure, if you just see this figure, it's a bit difficult to read actually, but let's comparing the least experienced group and the most experienced group, we can find that during the same work hours, people with more work experience they will have less need for recovery. This may indicate work experience can mitigate the negative, negative effects of long work hours on the need for recovery. But however, if we look at the people work over 60 hours, actually when people work, work over 60 hours, the work experience, even they have work experience, more work experience, but the need for recovery score is still very high. So this may represent when people working over 60 hours, the work experience may not help them to decrease the need for recovery significantly. And another interesting finding is that if you look at the middle two groups, there are some long linear fluctuation of the relationships. So this may indicate there's maybe an optimal point of the interaction effect of work experience and work hours on the need for recovery. Finally, let's uh, summarize the important findings of this research. So the first one is the need for recovery decrease with age while increasing with work hours. And there's an interaction effect of work experience and work hours on need for recovery. And these positive uh, relationships between work hours here, especially for work less than 60 hours, and need for recovery was weaker for those uh, with greater experience, work experience. The significance of these uh, in research lies in introducing the concepts to wider audiences in the construction industry and drawing the attention for both researchers and construction practitioners to the need for recovery. There are also some limitations such as the small sample size and the limited statistic techniques because of the limited space of this research, this paper. So future, in future research, um, it is important to investigate the relationships between need for recovery and other variables, such as the psychosocial hazards. Uh, here, the psychosocial hazards also can represent the job characteristics and also the health, different health and well-being outcomes, burnout, depression, and also others' distress, anxiety, with more advanced methods. That's all. Thank you. OK. I have one. Um, it looked like the stuff, the sample was heavily 
bias towards what we call management supervisory type people. But uh, I'm assuming that there were some people that were doing you know, labor intensive work. And I wondered if, if in your study you'd be thinking about having some kind of variable where you measure that amount of sort of physical work that labor do, because you would think that someone that does a lot of physical work would need longer to recover yes. in that younger years before they, their sort of bodies became hard to it. Yes. Yeah, our sample size actually is com combine all the management and physical uh, tra traits people. Yeah. It will be interesting if we if the separate the sample size of different groups and then we may find some different findings for different occupational groups. Um, but for at present the research, the distribution of the occupation, yeah, most of them are the supervisor, the management level. Uh, because this is an at that time it's an ongoing research. So now we have more data. So it's like half and half. Yeah, may, maybe in the future it's interesting to separate the occupational groups and we may find some different findings. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the NFR? Because uh, it seems very interesting. It's the first time I'm hearing that term need for recovery. Oh, yeah. Is that like a, like a measurement here or, or how? Yeah. Yeah, need for recovery actually, there's uh, this study is measured based on the previous research, and that scale is already a mature scale in this area. It's very popular. So, actually, need for recovery, it represents the you can see this model. Uh, yeah, here it's a mechanism of need for recovery. Need for recovery actually is here load effects. This part including the need need for recovery, like the physical and mental load, actually it's a, a symptom of the temporary, a collection of symptom of temporary feeling, uh, such as the overload or social withdrawal. And it can also be an early symptom of the mental health problems. So if there are there are some studies in other industries, they uh, they measure the how need for recovery, how job characteristics influence need for recovery, and then need for recovery will finally result in the mental health problems. So the how is that measured based on a scale. Yeah, the school have different uh, measurement items, 12 items, and then it's a five point scale. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Ali Rashidi, who is a le senior lecturer, lecturing at, at um, Menage yeah. University, which is here in Melbourne, and then also a research fellow at Menage University in Malaysia. And his paper is on evaluating the effectiveness of BIM-based virtual reality of coordinating design disciplines in a building renovation project. Thank you, Richard. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ali. Uh, thanks, Richard, for the introduction. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of my student, uh, Amjad. Um, uh, he was trying to bring along this uh, study, uh, experimental study, to looking at the effectiveness of the beam based virtual reality for coordinating the design disciplines in a building renovation projects. We have other researchers in this project, uh, Laura, Duncan, and uh, Medot, 
uh, the uh, uh, future building initiatives uh, jointly running by uh, architecture and civil engineer at Monash University and also uh, associate professor Medad as part of our civil engineering department at Monash Clayton. Um, so first thing first, I want to just cover a little bit about the backgrounds and also research method and results and analysis and jumping to the conclusions and future directions in this research study. Um, as a startup, um, just uh, looking at the clash detection and analysis, um, we've been trying to just looking at the clash detection analysis and then, uh, you know, traditionally and conventionally as part of the um, clash detection analysis, we are putting the uh, superimposing the lot of papers together and uh, overlapping the papers and plans and in order to do the clash detections. But clash detection analysis is part of the building information modeling. And uh, the, in terms of types of clashes, we have three different clashes uh, in terms of classification. We have hard clashes, soft clashes and time clashes. And then in terms of uh, hard clashes, it means uh, if I'm defining that one, it means when they're physically two components or elements of the buildings in the uh, building inform um, information modeling platform clashing. And that one like a mechanical ductings or the MEP systems to the structural systems uh, in our platform. Uh, when we are calling as soft clashes, it means they are the building components or elements that are located uh, quite near and are also not following the required uh, minimum clearance distance as defined by the building code or other authorities. Um, that one is also is part of our uh, clash detection analysis. And then last one is about the time clashes. And uh, that is talking about the 4D beam, that, and that one is about the scheduling and also the time planning. When we are ahead of that or uh, going to put in some delays. Um, so in this research study, we focus on the hard clashes um, and because we are looking for the renovation projects, looking for the MEP, mechanical, electrical, uh, plumbing systems and the structural components as part of the renovation project. So um, uh, as part of the backgrounds in terms of conventional method of clash detection analysis, we always relying on the visual uh, process of and uh, rigorous uh, calculations of professionals in our AEC industry for identifying the clashes manually by overlay, uh, overlaying the drawings together. And also, the, and they do the manual detections by the visual explorations of that one and continue and, and, and trying to just finding that clashes uh, by putting the uh, plans together. So, and current clash uh, uh, detection challenges, and specifically, I'm referring back to the Department of Facility Management at Monash University that is currently uh, using the conventional method. We are, uh, we've been looking at the AutoCAD as a, a format of uh, drawings and then using the 2D format. So the 2D representations of and that one is really hard to find all clashes, hard clashes. And, and also we, we can see even we are using the beam platform like a Revit in a, on, a, on a screen is quite difficult to find and do some uh, uh, rectifying those clashes in our, before going for renovation projects. And also manual calculations of that one is required uh, to get some information. Somehow we need the elevations, dimensions, all those kind of stuff and running by our professionals in order to figure out is there any issue behind the uh, drawings um, with the different uh, design disciplines like MEP, structural, architectural or before we jumping into the construction phase. So uh, based on that, uh, we've been trying to integrate in the virtual reality uh, with our uh, building information modeling for renovation projects at Monash University um, in order to 
transforming the way that we are right now practicing the, for the clash detection analysis. So uh, we've been trying and uh, uh, formulating that uh, research study and bringing down into some research questions in order to find the key enablers and understanding the application of virtual reality in building model visualizations and also analyzing uh, the VR environments for visual explorations of clashes in BIM, BIM platform. And based on that, we formulated the three hypotheses. And the hypothesis later on, I will touch that one, is following the Stanford University shared test method in order to look at the time of detections and also accuracy and, all, and usability of that. So based on that, uh, the research design and the me uh, methodology, uh, we are running the experimental study in order to compare the conventional method of uh, practice with the innovative uh, form of practice that we call it the 3D beam based VR platform. And also we use the 2D AutoCAD drawings in our conventional methods. Uh, so we try to just put in the one month gap that that one is following the uh, psychology of learning and uh, uh, mental retentions in terms of forgetting care. We have to put in at least one month gap in order to control the learning be, uh, between the conventional and innovative method. We've been trying to bring along the 15 participants as suggested by the shared test method. At least we have to bringing the 10 participants to validating that one. So uh, we, we choose uh, those uh, uh, participants. They are uh, ready to go to the industry as a final year civil engineering students. And then the case study is the lab renovation projects on the facility management department of Monash University in Malaysia campus. We've been trying to bring in some uh, instruments and then doing some instrumentations uh, using the VR and then HTC Vive and uh, using some modeling stuff first, virtual reality, real time renderer in order to come uh, running our experimental study. So based on that, uh, we have a pre-experiment and a post-experiment questionnaire. Um, so in the pre-experiment questionnaire, we try to get some demographics and uh, also previous experience that they have uh, based on the beam modeling. So uh, in terms of uh, participants demographics, uh, the majority belongs to the male and then unfortunately they, um, we have a couple of uh, uh, females here. And uh, but the interesting part is about uh, the ability to read the uh, design drawings. Um, so since they are very young and uh, ready to go to the industry, they had a uh, uh, majority um, sh shifting towards the poor and very poor uh, in terms of ability to read the design drawings, putting together and then finding the clashes. Um, so this experimental study is going to test them. So they are not really expert in clash detection and analysis. In terms of their beam familiarity, um, so we can see uh, as uh, only 13% 13, 13 of them um, they are quite familiar with the Revit as part of the BIM platform, uh, but the majority is around 86%, more than 86% of them never ever going through the BIM environments. So, and then they educated based on the other structural software, uh, not the BIM based one. Familiarity with the using the VR. And this is the interesting part for me as well. The young generation, the new generation, they are quite familiar with the VR and the virtual reality because might be they are gamer. And then they are going through the game environments. That's why they um, uh, respond to 73% of them. Um, they are familiar with the VR uh, environment. Um, jumping to our three hypotheses, um, we designed that one as a be following the uh, shared test method, as I mentioned, as part of the initiative in Stanford University. And also in order to be comparing the conventional to the innovative and doing some evaluation and testing of the effectiveness of 
computing system compared to the conventional 2D base, uh, 2D paper based systems. We tested the three factors, three hypotheses, accuracy, speed, and usability. So in terms of accuracy, uh, uh, we, we designed this, uh, we purposely designed the six clashes in this experimental study. And we, we had 15 participants, and we can see here when we are comparing the conventional to the innovative process. In conventional process, uh, the average of the participants, they, they found at least one clashes, but when they, uh, we put them into the VR environment, they had more than two clashes. Their uh, capability is growing up. So as we can see here, the first hypothesis that we had uh, in terms of accuracy, the innovative process, giving them the more opportunity to find the clashes compared to the conventional method, which is the 2D paper base. And also the, the, on the right hand side, uh, we can see the um, um, spend time that they had on the, uh, each clashes. So the details of that one we presented in the paper, but this one is a summary of that one. When we are comparing the 2D CAD paper base compared to the 3D beam base VR, we can see in the average uh, on the paper base, they spend it around 10 minutes in order to find each clashes. But in terms of beam VR, uh, it jumps uh, and bring down to the four, four and a half minutes. And then the fastest one that they found is the clash number three. It was around eight minutes times. And when we, when we are comparing that one to the innovative, we can see even that one is getting much more faster and shorter time for them in order to find the clashes in the building components. In terms of usability, uh, we try to give them the time limitations, uh, 15 minutes for each uh, uh, clashes at least if they can just finishing one clashes and finding one clash, it means that system is usable as defined by charities. So we, in short, uh, 11 participants identify at least uh, one clash in the conventional process, and uh, whereas the 14 participants in the innovative, they found the clashes. Uh, so it means again in the usability factor, also VR has some more improvement. Uh, jumping to the participants' uh, perceptions as a post-experiment uh, questionnaire. So we try to bring those factors as a shared test as part of the external validity. This one we try to check in with them, with the participants perceptions in terms of internal validities. As we can see, uh, we, we put the two factors, ease of use of that platform for the future practice. And um, in terms of conventional compared to the innovative, 12 out of 15 participants, around 80% of them find that uh, the task is really difficult and very difficult when they are practicing the 2D based, paper based. But in terms of innovative process, uh, still we have a balance. 40% uh, of them is finding it's very easy uh, and, um, and easy for them to find the clashes. Another 40% another, uh, they found it uh, difficult. Um, this is quite interesting because um, um, there are some other factors behind the VR platform I'll be share with you later. Um, and when we are looking at the overall satisfaction of them, um, conventional methods still has a priority to the VR. Even in terms of external validations, in terms of accuracy, in terms of time, in terms of usability, we got a very good result out of that. But participants, they are preferring to go through the paper base because still our participants, they are feeling the, the gadgets and the infrastructure and also all those kind of hardware things is not mature enough. It's very heavy, put them into the dizziness mode and they got a lot of sickness um, because when they are spending more than 20 minutes in that environment, some of them, they are not feeling well. 
So that's why in the overall satisfaction, still they are strong and they are, they are even, it's very difficult for them. They, they are preferring going through that one. It's quite interesting for us as well. So as a conclusion, um, 3 dbmr is offering the, definitely as a promising tool to improve the clash detection and collaboration um, in terms of time and speed is half of the uh, conventional methods. And, in the, and our data shows that the innovative process significant in terms of accuracy and then very fast compared to the conventional practice. And in, innovative uh, process was also very usable, but it is uh, uh, recommended for the further study for developing a frameworks for clash detection analysis. If you want to go in for practice in, in future, at any departments or industry, it will be good to bring the frame framework for how to go through the, any platforms to do the clash detection analysis, especially in the um, 3D beam based VR environment. And also this prototype testing is kind of helpful for designers, builders, uh, that they are deciding to undertake a coordination process, redesigning or renovating um, by using the BEAM and VR technologies. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Probably have time. We have four minutes for maybe one or two questions. Have anyone answered? Any questions at all? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, you did this with students who, like, as you said, didn't really know what they were doing anyway because they're not experienced. Did you give any thought to what might happen if you did the same experiment with experienced people? Um, not specifically for clash detection analysis. We did one, another study with, for using the 4D beam in virtual reality. That one we published on the, the CONVR conference. And then that one is quite different um, because to me, um, when we are uh, looking at the students, and especially those students is on the level of going to the industry, um, some of them, they train for the four years still with the paper-based and the non-beam-based softwares. That's why in the overall satisfaction, they get back to the, to the conventional one, which is trained with them. They have more confidence. And um, that's a very good suggestion because I think as part of the extension of this study, we have to see what is the perception of the experienced people and those who are working at the industry. And then maybe they are, we had a couple of things again, I from share with you, frankly, still the heavy equipment and then sickness and then nausea and also dizziness this is still there when, when we are designing the experiment for the long, long time. If that one is less than 20 minutes, 15 minutes, everybody happy about that one. But if they have to go for each clash, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then that one is two hours time, they have to go in and browsing everything for two hours, it's a little bit, they are not feeling well. So if you were using that during a working day, it would be, be unbearable? Yeah, that's, that's the thing, because that one is, is getting back to the VR. And then, so somehow we are not saying, not promoting and saying our studies fancy fancy things so, but these are the facts behind the VR and AR things might be AR is is giving more, more opportunity compared to the VR but these kind of factors that when we are designing this kind of experiments we have to consider the duration of that experience experimental studies Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you might get a different result if the plan was quite complex. Yeah. You would have said the conventional in no way, you know. Um, exactly. That, that's a very good point. Exactly. If you are putting more complex or complexity factor behind uh, clashes, especially the hard clashes, maybe they never ever find the clashes on a 2D uh, paper based platform and they have to go through the uh, visual. 3D environment. That's a really good. Yeah. 
uh, one thing one thing in this study we try to uh, stick to that uh, we bring the real case here it's not a conceptual one so that that lab is already renovated and then that lab was under the renovation and I'm, I'm just sharing with you we put only six here but frankly we figure out that more than 10 or might be more than that clashes and then nobody nobody going through that one and they are going for the renovation yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. No Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I will be presenting uh, our paper on uh, uh, weather and suicide of uh, construction workers. I'm sorry to bring up this uh, a bit dark topic, but this is, um, I mean, a serious issue that uh, construction industry is facing uh, at the moment. Uh, so intentional self-harm is, is regarded as uh, the first unnatural uh, cause of death among uh, people here in Australia and also in many other developed uh, countries. Uh, so statistics uh, shows that uh, it's the top 15 uh, leading cause of, uh, of death uh, here. And uh, of course, th th there are some differences between male and female. Uh, so suicide among male is the top 10th cause of, uh, of death compared with, um, uh, with female, which is ranked at uh, 20 seconds uh, cause of death among female. In construction industry, it's uh, regarded as uh, the highest uh, industry with um, a number of cases of uh, suicide. And um, the suicide rate among construction workers is uh, reported to be between um, 24 to 40 uh, percent per uh, 100,000, which is much higher than, than uh, uh, the rate of uh, suicide among the general population reported as uh, between uh, 12 and uh, 18 person per 100,000. Uh, I remember I attended the first um, hackathon, uh, that's construction um, a hackathon conducted in Sydney in, before the lockdown in 2019. And the suicide was, was the top issue discussed during that, uh, uh, during, uh, that event. Uh, so um, uh, being a construction worker, uh, I mean, you have a high chance of um, of dying by um, suicide rather than the normal injury of the workplace. And uh, the issue is uh, is um, uh, is evident among um, uh, uh, the, the the blue workers or machine operators, and also young uh, construction workers. So, um, uh, among the the all cases of. Uh, Blue workers, about 25% of these of those cases are for workers uh, 24 years or, or, or younger, uh, compared with the general um, um, uh, population of construction workers. So, being uh, blue collar and young uh, construction, uh, put, uh, 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 putting them at a high risk of uh, of this issue. And um, we, we reported some studies from uh, from the literature in. The UK, the USA, and uh, and uh, Canada and Korea, and uh, they are also also citing the uh, the same issue. So it seems to be a global problem, but uh, it cannot be confirmed, as there is a need to conduct more research to to see uh, if if uh, if this issue is is also evident uh, or contributing uh, uh, to the construction nature itself. Of course, there are many. Uh, negative consequences of this problem and uh, this ne negative consequences are not uh, only for the families of uh, the deceased uh, uh, workers but also to the whole construction industry and its negative uh, image as being a dangerous uh, sector and in one study uh, the cost of uh, uh, suicide and suicide attempts was 
uh, about uh, 1.5 billion in, in 2010 alone. Uh, so, uh, of course, there are more negative consequences on uh, productivity of workers, ability to retain uh, uh, workforce and, and other economic uh, issues. Uh, what have been done so far to overcome this issue? Uh, I think uh, one of the main uh, initiative is, uh, is MATES in construction, which is a charity established uh, in 2008 just for the sole purpose of uh, overcoming this issue. And they provide different uh, supports such as uh, training programs, awareness programs, and also support for the families as well of, uh, uh, of the affected uh, uh, workers. Uh, in collaboration with, with MATES, the Blueprint framework also was developed with five pillars, uh, mainly to enhance the working environment, reduce the negative uh, working environment, uh, as well as support construction workers and support their uh, mental health. Suicide is a bit complex issue and it involves the combination of different uh, factors and causes. Uh, but we categorized uh, the causes into uh, three main uh, factors based on the literature review. Uh, first one is work-related factor. As we know, uh, construction is uh, high demanding. Um, uh, it it causes a lot of stress and um, most uh, work is conducted on a stake of completion on time. Uh, and also um, some of the construction work conducted in, in uh, in a bit far uh, sites, isolated sites, where workers are a bit far from their um, families and social groups. So the nature of, of, the, of the work, combined with uh, injuries and, and other factors, can contribute to more severe uh, mental health and stress. And there are some personal factors to, to this issue, such as prior uh, psychiatric uh, issues, uh, child custody issues, uh, separation or divorce, and, and other um, uh, factors, uh, in, including also not to, not to forget to mention uh, um, uh, um, the, the, the abuse of, uh, of substance such as alcohol and, and drugs, all are contributing factors. Uh, social factors include things, uh, lack of social support within the construction site or the community of, uh, of workers, uh, what's called macho culture, where as we know, construction is uh, is a male dominant industry, um, and therefore, um, uh, I mean, this this sector is famous of being, uh, uh, I mean, uh, male are difficult uh, are facing difficulty to pour out their emotions or issues. So uh, often, uh, a male will find it difficult to share their issues or problems with with uh, peers. So all of these uh, factors are believed to be uh, contributing to increasing uh, the suicide rate. Uh, in our research, we, we try to see if there is a link between weather and, and the increasing uh, suicide rate among construction workers. So as, as I stated before, uh, this issue is evident in, uh, in the construction industry and similar industries such as mining. So uh, the, the research tried to uh, ask if, if there is any influence of uh, weather on the increasing suicide rate, and if, if so, uh, how, why weather is one of the contributing factors. Uh, I think most of us can agree that uh, weather has physical influence on, on workers. We know that, for example, um, high temperature and uh, harsh weather can cause uh, heat stress. It, it has also other influences on mood uh, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, can weather also contribute to psychological issues and, and districts? This is what uh, are we trying to accomplish through uh, the conducting of this research. So th there are some facts related to, uh, to our hypothesis that weather might be one of the triggering factors. The first one is most of the construction work is conducted on sites under the direct influence of, uh, of weather. So there is, of course, uh, definitely um, a physical influence on it, but it's not clear whether it has a psychological influence. Uh, second, uh, based on uh, research from uh, the psychology field, uh, it, ha it has been noticed that uh, 
suicide rate has has a type of trend where suicide increases during certain uh, seasons. And it's surprising uh, to know that uh, uh, suicide increases during summer and and spring. Unlike unlike the belief that winter is one of one of the factor one one of the risky uh, seasons, but in fact it's spring and and uh, and summer. And and uh, I mean w in our paper we we have cited the relevant uh, studies that that discussed uh, I mean uh, the seasonality of of uh, of suicide. And also some scholars uh, found a correlation uh, between some meteorological factors such as temperature, humidity and, uh, and sunshine and the suicide rate. Uh, how weather can or might be one of the contributing factors? Uh, I believe there are three uh, levels of uh, weather influence on, uh, on the suicide rate. It could be a direct influence. Uh, sunshine, for example, can influence some hormones in our body which are linked to depression. And depression is is one of the of the main factors that may lead to suicide and suicidal uh, thinking. Uh, seasonality and the different uh, uh, working patterns uh, throughout the year that uh, that uh, construction is. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, it can be noticed uh, during different times of the year. Um, might might be also a triggering factor, which is again can be linked to to the to the weather. And then lastly is the indirect uh, factor or influence. So for example, uh, uh, in agriculture, um, uh, suicide rate increases during certain seasons <clears throat> due to uh, the hardship and resulted from uh, uh, the, the, the fluctuation in the weather and drought, for example, which contribute to, um, to, uh, to uh, economic hardship leading to uh, to intentional self-harm later on. Uh, so it could be, uh, I mean, in general, uh, weather can have uh, both direct and indirect uh, relationship with uh, with the increasing suicide rate among construction. But it's not clear until now. I mean, this is a research gap that has, for, for the best of our knowledge, that have not been addressed uh, before. And in our research, we will try to explore if uh, suicide rate in, in construction uh, has a seasonality pattern as well compared or similar to uh, the general population. And also we will uh, investigate if certain weather factors uh, such as uh, temperature and sunshine uh, may have a correlation with, uh, the, with the suicide rate. So uh, we will collect uh, data from two sources. One is from uh, meteorological uh, uh, department and the second is from uh, National Coronial Information System. Uh, so we have collected uh, the meteorological data, but we are still waiting <coughs> for uh, NCIS uh, data. Uh, to conclude, um, I mean, this research has highlighted uh, um, uh, the importance of uh, psychological distress uh, and suicide in construction uh, industry and the importance or the need to do more research in this area. Although it's, it's a bit dark area, as I said, but uh, it's under-researched area. Uh, and it seems to be, uh, as I highlighted before, a global phenomenon. Uh, th therefore, uh, more research uh, should be conducted uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, now, if we, uh, if we collected the data and find some uh, seasonality or some uh, correlation with uh, weather uh, um, uh, data or, or variables. Uh, this may have an impact on uh, certain uh, procedures and programs uh, in the area. For example, uh, awareness programs of mates can be targeted during the risky seasons. Um, and uh, on-site safety procedures can take into consideration the increase in uh, sunshine or temperature, if there is a, any correlation between the two. This is yet to be explored and verified in uh, empirical study in the future. Uh, among the challenges that we faced in conducting this research is uh, difficulty to find data. Whether data is, is actually available, it's, it's free, it's public, but uh, suicide data is, is really uh, difficult to collect. And uh, ethics application uh, takes very long time. 
and we are still uh, until uh, this time working uh, on the application. Hopefully we will be able to collect uh, uh, sufficient data. I mean, our plan is to, co to, to collect data for the past 20 years compared with weather data during the same time and see if there is any associ association between the two factors. Right, uh, that's, that was the end. Happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you very much. challenge maybe that I thought of as we're talking about it and thinking about, you know, construction is highly susceptible to weather conditions. So, but even the same construction site, its susceptibility to weather changes over time. So the very onset of the early parts of the project, sun, rain, and weather are very, you're very susceptible to it. But maybe as the building or the enclosures become closed off, you're now working in a different environment that isn't as highly affected by weather. Uh, so I'm curious if you find data, uh, and of course you've been thinking about this further, you may have projects that are working in tunnels where there is no weather other than something other than maybe a secondary effect of the weather. So yeah. kind of matching up that data sounds like it might be a challenge. Yes, I, th I think that's a good question. So type of project might be uh, also one of the factors. Because, as you know, we have different types of, of uh, construction projects, building infrastructure, roads, and so on. So uh, if if talking about building project, yes, as you said, we have the enclosed uh, environment which can protect workers from, uh, from weather. But uh, it will be interesting if, if we could find this detailed data about, uh, about it. Yeah. Do you have a question? I was intrigued by your first slide when you talked about um, um, that there is some evidence exists somewhere in Canada and Korea, which both countries are well known for, you know, extreme cold weather during the winter season. So I'm just wondering what is what triggered that to do that in Australia when we don't have such cold weather? What was the trigger to think, oh, I'll go down that path to look if there is a connection between weather and suicide? Um, the, the connection is uh, uh, the fact that construction work is conducted outside. This is one thing. Second is uh, suicide rate among the general population has a trend. As I said before, it's not, I mean, during certain seasons, there is there is a peak of suicide, let's say during the summer and uh, spring, especially spring, number of cases of suicide is, is, is the maximum. Uh, and this noted in more than one study previously in different countries, not only Australia. I guess lead to this conclusion that there is a link between weather. Like for example, construction is not the only outdoor, you know, uh, you know, activity that has outdoor activities. Okay, I can think of lots of things. Yeah. You know, that people work day in, day out in, you know, you know, exposed to weather patterns. Yeah. Is there any work that's been done in other industries? Uh, in, in among the general population, again, yes. I mean, th th there is, uh, in terms of so, uh, seasonality, yes, there is a clear, I can say, majority of research confirmed that there is there is a se seasonality uh, in the society. But in terms of correlation with weather factors, there is kind of debate between scholars. Some said yes, there is a correlation. Others said no. But all research is conducted um, among the general population, not for a specific uh, trade or, or, or sector. Thank you. So, I, I was intrigued by your last slide, which is the data collection. But one of the things that I know triggered, that's triggered after a suicide in the United States is that there is a coroner's report. And I don't know how publicly accessible those are. But I'd imagine they'd be a very, very valuable source of data. And those would obviously give you the time of death. It's where you, you could look at particular weather. But I would also think they would they would maybe throw up some other causes when they're read. And I wonder if you'd started looking into the sort of data that's available in those or if you can try to get hold of them. Yes, so uh, here in Australia and also New Zealand, they have what's called NCIS, 
National Coronial Information System. This is where you will find um, a lot of information about uh, suicide um, uh, since 2000. So, uh, but as 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 you you mentioned, it's not um, publicly available, and it requires uh, a lot of I mean many approvals and uh, ethics applications uh, to be able to access. Uh, I mean this th this information. It is, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, we will be able to collect uh, detailed information on construction workers, also the skill level of construction workers, uh, location, uh, and of course the season of incident, and also if there is, if there are also other uh, issues like prior psychological uh, problem, which can be used as a control variable when we do the analysis. Type of trade, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Just one thing, going back to what Catherine said, uh, in the UK, obviously the, the weather is generally crap. Um, we have something called seasonal affective disorder. I don't know if you came across that. So it's actually something that's been recognised. And I actually, I don't think this is particularly robust, but there's one day of the year that's been recognised as the mm. most depressing day of the year in England. Uh, and so, you know, if there is a general recognition <coughs> in England that. The times of the year are more wishable than others. Unsurprisingly, it's the winter. It's winter, is it? Yeah. The summer and, and spring, yeah. Because, I mean, uh, it's difficult to explain, but uh, because the change happened very quick between the, the seasons from cold to, to warm. So, um, yeah, I, I need to learn more about it. I mean, how it happened, actually. But I, I had the same idea that winter is, is, is the. Rate will go up. Um, and in summer, if the weather becomes too hot, then construction work has to stop. Um, would that be the reason why uh, that suicide rate goes up? Because they are out of job. They, they, they don't work, they don't get paid instead of the weather. Would that be anything possible like that? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there is also a, a pattern among construction workers. It's, it's not confirmed yet. So at this stage, we don't know whether there is a pattern of suicide. If there is, then is it the weather or is it, as you said, long holidays? Uh, all of this are still yet to be explored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm not sure. I mean, among the general population, yes, there is there is a trend. And uh, for example, here in Australia, I mean, there was one study conducted globally, and they noticed that uh, spring again. I mean, we in Australia we have different uh, timing of uh, of seasons, yeah, yeah, yeah. but still spring and 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 summer are the main. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That's another additional variable that we can yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, you just remind me of uh, another study that uh, looked at uh, patterns. So they noticed also long holidays is, is, is one of one of the factors. Yeah, so. yeah so it, it's not it's not a direct influence of whether it's uh, it's indirect influence related to hardship and Stress to find another job, yeah. which is true. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we we better head back because I think the panel session started four minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.